hearts, to offer ourselves, to offer our worship, to share a meal together, but also to remember the soul of our martyrs. So um, we're going to put up the the whole no, can't put it up just yet. Okay. <laughs> we will put it up if you haven't seen the information about the the celebration this week for um, on Thursday evening there will be a fair meeting and the recipients will retreat and on Saturday the next way that the people will disappear from. Um, and we will have, I'm going to encourage you to send messages and photographs to Roger's email if you have any and we will put together a book um, of visits for quite a few um, and the But more on that when we are able to put the picture up. But let us now take some time in silence, in prayer, whatever you wish to um, all martyrs and colleagues and their times with the family in our presence. So I would like to sit. If you so feel, please pray. Um, not, we're going to take a few minutes. Don't be uncomfortable with the silence. Silence is okay. You can leave the picture. Thank you.
and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So let us confess our sins, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with our neighbor. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. 
please stand for our gradual hymn and remain standing for the reading of the gospel.
allow it to find seed and fruitful soil in our lives. Amen. Amen. Please sit down. The gospel lesson today is one of those Bible stories, the ones that were told in Sunday school. If you didn't know, there are actually three versions of the story. Because there are four gospels, one gospel doesn't include the story. But the story is told three times in different ways, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So this is a story that we are often told in Sunday school. And it's one of those that even if you never passed the doors of a church, you would know. But there is also some danger in this passage. A danger that familiarity brings, and we all know familiarity brings complacency. And we know that story. It's a miracle. Jesus was able to feed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. <laughs> A danger that when we read it, we think how very nice. Jesus was amazing. He could take the fish and the loaves and he was able to bless it and feed 5,000 more, more than 5,000 people. But what does it mean for us? What does it say to us about Jesus' character? And what does it mean for us who attempt to follow Jesus? So let's consider the broader picture. Jesus is tired. The disciples are tired and the crowd is tired. It's been a long day. Jesus had hoped to go away to a lonely place, to be quiet, to mourn and to reflect and to pray. Because if you read the passage before, you will see that John the Baptist had been killed. So Jesus needs the sign. I think I'll put it up just here, Julie, because it's gone. <laughs> I'll ask you when. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be confusing. John the Baptist has just been killed. <coughs> so now Jesus wants to take time to withdraw and reflect and to mourn. The sun is shining. The dirt roads are uneven. People's feet are sore. They want to rest. The evening comes and the people are growing grumpy because they are tired and they are hungry. And the disciples are more than ready to send these people on their way. We've had enough of them. And they say to Jesus, send them away. So that they can go buy their own food because they must be thinking, oh, we're going to need all these people. <laughs> Nevertheless, the abundance of love which Jesus has for all as Jesus looking out over this crowd of all ages, of all races, of all backgrounds. And he has compassion for them. And the passage says that he even cured their sick. So Jesus has compassion on these people. He saw that they were hungry. And he fed them. And in that moment, in this story, we are shown a foretaste of the example of God's abundance and the reality of the kingdom of God, of what God wants for God's kingdom and what God wants for us. Where generosity and love abound even in the most barren places, even in the times when people are at their lowest, even when people are, there, are at their most grumpy and desperate, God does not turn away. God opens God's arms wide and people are fed. Because it says, he, it, it says he blessed the food. He opened, Jesus opened his arms and he blessed the food. So even though he may have been tempted to send him away, to take time for his own grief and for his own pain, Jesus' first instinct is to care and to love and to tend to the people. Regardless of what is going on within himself. That's very difficult to do. There are lessons in it for us. First, in all things, Jesus remains steadfast. And second, 
to truly follow Jesus, we need to find a way to emulate the same compassion and love and care for those around us, even when it may feel difficult to do so. So that's the gospel lesson for today. And you know the story really well, so I thought I wouldn't spend too much time on the gospel lesson for today, but to go back to the Old Testament <coughs> to our friend Jacob. <laughs> the Old Testament reading is also one of those that people know, whether you are Christian or Jewish or whether you are not. Many people know the story about Jacob. Last week we read about Jacob's ladder and the dream that he had. And this week we see Jacob fighting with someone. To call that this violent encounter, I hope you can see it because it's here. To call this violent encounter between a stranger, a stranger because we don't know who this person is that is fighting and wrestling with Jacob. And Jacob, whom we know is a liar and a trickster. Mm. To call this one of my favorite stories in the Bible doesn't feel quite right. But I am indebted to the story because more than any other story in scripture, Jacob's story has helped me to hang on as a Christian woman. Jacob's experience shapes my view of God and why a wrestling match has become my gateway into faith. A wrestling match. Because for all of us at some stage, our faith is a wrestle. As the story begins, Jacob is returning to the place of his birth after 20 years away. And he is bracing himself to reunite with his brother Esau. The brother whose life he ruined through deceit and manipulation. Jacob has no idea how Esau is going to respond to him, and he is afraid. And after sending his wives, his two wives, remember? You remember the story now? He got the first, he had to marry the first sister, and then he got the second sister, whom he really wanted to marry. The New Testament version that was read, that version from the NIV said, and his slaves. But the version I use says, after sending his wives, his concubines, his children, and all his possessions ahead of himself, Jacob decides to spend the night alone in the desert. And scripture doesn't tell us why, but of course we can speculate why he wanted to be alone. Maybe he wants to pray and beg God for help. Maybe he wants to scheme and strategize before he faces his brother. Because remember, there's no love lost between these two brothers. Maybe he's overwhelmed by anxiety and actually wishes to hide. Or maybe he's a coward who needs his family to run into Esau first and to smooth things over for him. We don't know. All we know is that Jacob is isolated and he is vulnerable in a way that he hasn't been for a long time. And on this lonely night, he can't hide behind wealth and servants and a large family because they went ahead of him. It's dark and desolate. And a nameless and faceless stranger leaps out of nowhere and throws Jacob to the ground. And so already the story resonates personally for me and it might for you also. How often have you found yourself alone in the dark in a des desolate place? How often in that darkness have you done battle with something that you won't recognize as God until much later? Then you see it. Oh, is that what you meant, God? But it was a battle at the time. Scholars have debated for many years about what really happened in that story. Is he attacked by robbers? Does he have a panic attack? Is the stranger perhaps his brother Esau? For me, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter because all of the battles of our lives are battles with guilt, with fear and doubt and grief and unforgiveness. 
how race to be mentioned with our families and with our friends and our community and with the church. Hmm. All are ultimately battles with God. <coughs> Think about it. When God says we must forgive, you want to hold a grudge. I've had it. Enough is enough. Seventy times seven. No, Lord. Enough is enough. With grief, what do we often do when we are grieving? We want to bargain with God. If this, Lord, then I will do this. When we go through stages of grief, there are seven stages, and one of them is bargaining. And we will all do it, or we all might have done it already. Drama with family and friends often ends up actually being drama and battles with God. Because we know what God expects of us. But it's hard. It's hard to follow. Our relationship with God is a fight that wants us to bend and to break and to remake us. I am the potter, you are the potter. <coughs> Mold me and make me. Sometimes we must be broken and we must stop again. Whether we recognize the stranger as God or not, God is always the one we are wrestling with. God is always the one who battles with us and against us, not for our detriment, not to hurt us, but to transform us and to change us. <coughs> So Jacob and the man who is wrestling wrestles all night, the text says. And they wrestle until Jacob is almost sure that he is going to win. And they wrestle and their limbs are entangled and the eyes are fixed on each other until the dark <coughs> breaks and they see the dawn. And then it says a man leaping out of the darkness a pitched battle that lasted for hours. We still don't know who this is. We are, we know, on the side of the scripture that it is God. But what kind of God does this? What kind of God comes out in the middle of the night and battles with you when you are at your most vulnerable and scary? Right? You alone know where the desert of heaven is left. What kind of God does this? Wasn't God supposed to be loving and protective and keeping us safe? That is the image that we have of God. That is the image we have been taught about God. A loving, safe, father heart of God. Well, maybe not so. At least not in the ways that we define love to be positive and safe. Because people can tell us that they love us and they can hurt us. People, people can tell us that they will keep us safe and then we are unsafe. And as we begin this month of August and we are thinking about women, it's all of those things that will come into play this month. This month. It should be all months, all, all months, every day, all year. The God who goes toe to toe with Jacob is not the God whose first priority is to make us feel comfortable. That's not God. God doesn't make us comfortable. Because when we're comfortable, then we are okay. I don't need to do anything. I'll just sit here and watch life go by. You need to be uncomfortable. We must all be uncomfortable with what is going on around us so that we can do something. God is not a God who wants to maintain polite distance from us or mind God's manners and make us happy. No, <coughs> Jacob's God is wild and mysterious as we see in the picture. Unpredictable and strange. And Jacob's God doesn't hesitate to be in the mud, in the ugliness with Jacob while we wrestle. So that tells us we are never alone in our wrestling. God does not leave us. God is right there in the dirt and mud with us. This is a God of dust and sweat and blood and tears. All those words ring true as we face the cross where Jesus 
bland and sweet and dear. It's a God who is willing to become dirty to lift us out of the dirt. So if you are like me, Jacob's God is not the God, the God that we grew up with. I'm sure we were all told, God is watching you. You mustn't lie, you mustn't steal, you mustn't smoke, you mustn't whatever. God is watching you. And we have grown up with the idea that God is a scary man sitting on a chair writing down all of our sins. And he might even have a white beard. <laughs> okay? Those pictures in the, big, in the old Bible story, that's what Jesus looks like. That is not the God that I am in relationship with. And I pray that that is not the God that you are in relationship with. A God who gets easily offended. God is not fragile like a china teacup that will fall and be broken. Broke what a contrast to the God who spends an entire night in mud wrestling with Jacob. This is a God who wants to engage with us. A God who can throw, that we can throw ourselves against with our full weight, with our full thoughts, with our uncertainty. Because if we are honest, we are not always certain that God is with us. We are not always certain that God has God's eye on us because we feel alone. And where are you, Lord? Where are you? God invites us to be consistent. God who invites us to be intense about loving and following him. This is a God who doesn't let go. So all night they struggle in silence until the morning and then the stranger says to him, or he says to the stranger, you know, who are you? But before that happens, the sun is about to rise. <coughs> Jacob and the stranger are wrestling and then what happens? He touches his hip and Jacob actually loses the battle. It looks in the beginning like Jacob's going to win, but he touches his hip and Jacob is crippled and helpless. And the sense we have, which Jacob must have had, was that the whole battle was from the beginning fated to end this way. That the stranger had simply held back. And now, just before he has to leave, he does the worst damage. He touches his head. He would know that he was truly defeated, so that he would know that not all the shrewdness that he could muster was enough to get this done. So Jacob doesn't win. He's lost his grip. And he feels like the person that is drowning now. We live in a culture where success is everything and defeat many often, many times when we are defeated people will ridicule us, make fun of us, laugh at us. You were defeated. I'm sure there are many comments to make about the Bafana, but the other team. I'll just point out that the Bafana team have never made it to the last 16, but there's so much to be saying about that team. Right? Sometimes defeat is mercy. Sometimes we must just walk away. Sometimes we just have to give in. Defeat is very often something that saves us. What I carry away from the story of Jacob's wounding is troubling. But the solid truth is that blessings and bruising are not mutually exclusive. We get bruised and battered because we want to follow Jesus. Because Jesus didn't say it's going to be easy. And when we are bruised and battered, we feel defeated. But the sun does come up again tomorrow. It does indeed come up again tomorrow. We can't determine the blessings that we want from God. We can't do that. But what does Jacob do? Jacob says to this man, before you leave, give me a blessing. You've already now dislocated my hip, but before you leave, give me a blessing. And 
And sometimes, in this case, the blessing is the limp that Jacob gets. So as the dawn breaks, Jacob is as tenacious as ever. I won't let you go until you bless me. And sometimes the whole of Christianity comes down to saying, there's so much, I can't wrap my head around, but I know that there is a blessing in here somewhere for me. The madness of this world, we must almost look for the blessings. <coughs> the fact that you woke up this morning is a blessing. And the fact that you are here, no matter how cold you are, no matter how sore your knees might be, is a blessing. Don't often look at that. So Jacob hangs on because he wants this blessing. But first, the stranger says to Jacob, and this is a terrible thing for Jacob, actually. He asks him, what is your name? 20 years ago, now you see it all coming. You can probably see it all flashing through Jacob's mind. 20 years ago, somebody asked Jacob, what is your name? His father asked him, what is your name? His father was blind at the time. And Jacob didn't say he was Jacob. Jacob said he was Esau. Because he was shrewd and devious and he wanted his brother's birthright. And so now he's asked again, what is your name? He knows the immense power and blessing that he could be getting from this one that he was struggling with. But Jacob also knows he was deceitful and selfish at what he did to his father, he lies, what he does to his brother, he lies and drags his mother into it. And now he's asking, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. <coughs> and the answer is, you will no longer be called Jacob. You shall be called Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans, and you have prevailed. And this is the blessing that Jacob receives. A new name after fighting with God the whole night, what does he get? A new name. He doesn't also see that yet as the blessing. You shall be called Israel, meaning you shall spend the rest of your life limping while wrestling with God, battling with God, contending with God. You can no longer be the trickster and the devious son, the devious twin. From here on, you must wrestle. Wrestling, as it turns out, is not an irritant thing. I don't know if you watch wrestling, I don't. Mm -hmm. It looks a little violent to me. But <laughs> it's not irritant because it's the opposite of apathy. When you wrestle with God, you are getting in there. You ask him the few questions. You are muddy and dirty and God is in there with you.
can't all be princesses. The God of Jacob delights in those who strive. The opposite of loving God is in fighting God. So don't worry if you like wrestling. It's okay. God can handle them. God is so much bigger. Don't be afraid to be angry and to question. Because when you do that, you are wrestling with God. And so you are still in relationship with God. You haven't walked away and God has walked away from you. <coughs> wrestling keeps God relevant in our lives. It keeps God personal and of course to be reckoned with. To wrestle with God is to insist that God matters. When you read the passage further from Genesis, you will see that when Jacob meets Esau, the first thing he says to him is, for truly to see your face is to see the face of God. After 20 years. Sorry, here's your book right back. <laughs> no. For truly to see your face is to see the face of God. And so the story continues. The sun comes up. And they relay that place to me, which means I've seen God's face, face to face, and yet I have preserved, I have persevered, because we know from Moses that God says no one will see me face to face until they die. But here, Jacob gets to see God face to face, and he recognizes his brother. To see your face is to see the face of so these are the only places that we are looking for, that we must be searching when we are reading scripture. Not just the nice lovely stories where people are being fed, fish and bread, but really to struggle with the things that God calls us to be in a world that is so confusing. If you don't know the scriptures, you are going to really struggle to wrestle with all of the evil that is out there. But God says, come and wrestle with me. Because when you wrestle with me, you are in relationship with me. I have walked away from you, and you have walked away from me. May we prevail as we face the dark night, but as the sun rises, may our acts be the testaments of great joy that God gives to us, regardless of how we might be feeling. God's joy is far greater than we can ever imagine. And that is what we hold on to. Amen. Amen. Let's take a few moments to <coughs> pray. As we celebrate the Holy Eucharist to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for God's mercy, we pray for the Church in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. We pray for the Church throughout the world and especially for this diocese, for Joshua, the Bishop of Table Bay, and for Tabo, our Bishop and Archbishop. We pray especially this week for the College of the Transfiguration in Graemstown, Makanda, Celebrating 30 years as the seminary where clergy are trained to serve the Anglican Church of Southern <coughs> And we pray especially for our candidates who are there for Keegan Davis, Avron Flowers, and for Sitting Bees of Water. <coughs> Give your church power to proclaim the gospel of Christ and grant that we and all Christian people may be united in truth. Learn together in your love and reveal your glory to the world. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the resources of the world and its beauty. We thank you for the beautiful gift of sunshine and for some respite from the rain. We thank you for the flowers that we are beginning to see.
see blossoming. We thank you that our dams are full. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of stewardship that you have given to us. Give us a reverence for your creation and help us to be worthy stewards of all of these gifts. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the nations of the world. We pray for our own country. Father, we pray for the very volatile situation in the Western Cape surrounding the taxi industry. We pray for the many thousands of Catonians who were left stranded this week. We pray for an end to the very violent way in which South Africans think we can solve our problems. We pray for those who are in positions of authority, direct this and every nation in the way of justice and peace, that all may honor one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our families and friends and those with special claims upon us. We pray, Lord, for all families who care for older siblings, for parents, for in-laws. We pray, Lord, for grace. We pray for courage. We pray for perseverance. We pray, Lord, that they may always know your heart with your people. We pray for compassion. We pray for understanding as siblings work out who should be taking care of older and frail parents, as children work out who is best suited to be taking care of loved ones who need our help. You remind us of one of the commandments, honour your mother and your father. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours, that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as you have loved us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray for those in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We bring before you, Lord, families, friends, who may be struggling with various addictions. We pray, Lord God, for resources to be made available through the various departments in our government, the Department of Social Development. We pray, Lord, that the money that has been set aside to help those who are struggling with addictions may find its way to the very people who need it. We pray for families who are struggling, who are struggling to see your face in the face of their children or grandchildren who may be addicted to drugs and alcohol. To all who suffer, give courage, healing, and a steadfast trust in your love. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And we remember with thanksgiving your servants who have gone before us. And we mention them by name. We pray for Marcus Tina. I invite you to mention those of your loved ones who have passed on. <clears throat> right, John. And who's Luke Peterson? We remember with thanksgiving, and according to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Please, Dad, really making me
look quite beautiful. <laughs> Jesus stood among the disciples and said, Peace be with you. And they were glad when they saw the Lord. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you always. Peace, peace be with you. Peace be with you, my brother. <laughs>
Lord God of creation, for your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us to be found with the bread of life. This is the God of the earth. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, for us to be found with the cup of salvation. Which is the God of the earth. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We love Him, to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right in your eyes. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy. At all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For He is your living Word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born as man and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. And therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God of power and might, in heaven and earth of the Lord of glory, for standing in the highest, this is one of the in the name of the Lord, for standing in the highest. Not the shedding of the body of Christ. We are 
Father Almighty, Thomas 
you can go and listen to some really beautiful music, um, both from in the Queen Church Choir and from the boys at the ships. Um, and we pray that there will be TikToks so they can be work on their new church because their views are already away. <laughs> so please do support if you can. Um, and once again, if you have any notes or if you want to compile um, a message to Colleen and his family, if you have any pictures of Carl Marcus during his time here, please want to email them to Dodge and we will put together a book that we can give to the family. Uh, on Thursday evening is the um, fair meeting at St. Cyprian University and the service at the cathedral on Saturday morning with me in the beginning at 9 o'clock. I will say that if you're going to the funeral on Saturday, please go early. There is no parking at the cathedral. Mm -hmm. You will have to park somewhere in the city and be prepared to pay for the parking. <laughs> um, and also be prepared that will be a long service and that there will be many people, um, particularly since so our the service last time at the cathedral. Mm -hmm. There will be a big turnout of clergy and, and people. Uh, so bear that in mind if you are going to be going. We have also um, offered to assist the family in any way, so I will be blessing. We will, if, if we will put the blessing, we will give you some funds with whatever they might do. Um, we do have something that we can share, so we will do that. Anything else, people? No? Richard reminded me that I said I was leaving, and maybe you don't all know that I'm taking the last two months of my sabbatical. I took one month last year. So that is always three months. <laughs> and um, I catch the other two months, September and October, so I'll be away. And Duncan is coming to look after me for the rows for those two months. You will be in good hands. Um, I have no doubt about that. And everything else will catch up uh, because that's what you did here. <laughs> so um, Sunday, the 3rd of September, when we have baptism, we have baptism on that Sunday, will be my last Sunday before I we have nothing else to be said. We've all been patiently waiting to hear the two minutes that we place next year. Now that the bishop has told him, I can also tell you. Uh, Keegan is going to serve his curacy at St. Saviour's in Clare. So you, so you won't see him here. He now belongs to St. Saviour's Claremont. <laughs> um, but please pray for Keegan and for Adam as they seek him for their for the ordination. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those whom you love, and those whom you find that you love. <laughs> this day and always. Amen. <laughs> Christine is not here. She's very, very popular. Today she's taking the service at St. Peter's in Halloway, in at her home parish. But she should be back here soon. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you to Mark and Keenan and Richard for holding the sound. Um, the tastes are out of time. So thank you so much that you're leaving us. And you will.
to you, man. Yeah. <laughs>